So we might have low attendance today because I just now got this um, set up and posted. Hello, Gabriel. Nice to see you. Hello, Anthony. Yes, I'm well. Anthony says, hello, Eddie. Hope you are well. Yes, I'm well. Kind of busy today. But then I'm always busy, right? Um, you know, it's funny because a lot of people will say <clears throat> that I have a luxurious life. And, and in some ways, I guess you could say that's true. But I only have a luxurious life because I have to work so hard. It's a life of a self-employed person, you know. All right. So hopefully we'll pick up more people as we go. Not that I don't want to hang out with you guys, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know what I've been doing is I'm getting all of my videos for the whole year scheduled up all the way to the 1st of January. And... So I want them all finished by October 1st. So I've been working really, really hard. Um, I have three series coming out. The first one starts this week. What is the first one? Um, I think it's Stage Fright. I have a series on Stage Fright with five videos. Then we have a two-month, eight, eight, eight video series starting the month of September on listening. And yes, I know everybody rolls their, their eyes when I say listening, <laughs> right? So that's coming. Uh, that's eight videos in that series. So that's two months worth of videos. And then the last one is about culture. You know, I find myself all the time talking about culture lately and how important it is and and so yes and i think the reason i decided to do that was because of the listening videos in the listening videos i kept going back to the cultural connection and yeah so that's that's kind of the reason i decided okay let's do a whole five video series on the culture so I'm almost ready to upload them. I have, so I, I did it this time, I did it with what do you call assembly line style. So I, I recorded the videos first and then I edited the sound because I don't have a good camera for this. I have, I record the sound on my computer while I'm talking, but then that has to be edited because I, I do two, I do three edits. I edit the, the EQ, I edit the um, normalization, and I edit the gating. Um, that's why you don't hear a lot of trucks in the background and stuff like that, because I have gates. Um, and then I have to bring it to this computer. That, that's all on the, another computer. I bring it to this computer to put the videos all together. Hello, ACAC, nice to see you. And then that's the process I'm in now. So I have, it was 20, 20 videos total, I think 20, 10, no, 18, 18 videos total, five plus five plus eight, 18. Oh, I think the reason I was thinking 20 is because I recorded also the last two in that batch, uh, but those had to be out earlier because I didn't want to skip. That's the thing, right? Is I don't I want those Wednesday night videos to post regularly, but it's hard for me to do that and all the other stuff I'm doing. So 
my my plan is to get all those videos done. I got six more to do. I I have six more videos to edit here on this machine, and then um, I'll upload them all, get them scheduled. Then all the videos except for my music stuff. Um, I'll have all the hymns done. I'll have all the talking videos done, and um, and then aside from these Q and A's, um, everything will be done for the whole year. Then I can spend all that time practicing, composing, doing the publishing business, and what else? There was one other thing. Oh yeah, making, uh, so when I put videos up of my compositions, those are supposed to be demos. I'm not bragging to everybody how well I play or how well I write. That, that's not what that is. I'm not, I'm not trying to show anybody anything. I just want people to be able to hear the music before they buy it, and that's it. You know, I get, when I first started doing it, people made weird comments about how how um, I was showing off or something like that. And, you know, I, I'm not the kind of person that actually even needs to show off because I, I, I don't <laughs> – that's kind of a bad thing, right? Because I, I, it, what it means is I don't actually regard what people have to say about my stuff. <laughs> so I like when people are – so, like, for example, when some of you guys say on the Q&A, you say, oh, your book has helped me. I'm not saying, hey, that's great because I want more people to like my stuff. I'm saying that's great because I'm happy that the book is working for you. You know? I guess I, in that regard, I'm a very weird person. Anthony says, I have been doing your physical trumpet pyramid religiously every day and you know it is great for reasons that it keeps things in order you remember to do everything you need to do that's absolutely true having a routine stabilizes your your practice day right when you have a routine now the first routine I did was not my own. The first routine I did came from a book. Let me go grab it real quick because I think you'll find this interesting. Okay, that was a waste of time. I apologize. It's not where it belongs. But the Ernest S. Williams book. So for those of you who don't know who Ernest S. Williams was, he was a trumpet player. He was a band director and a composer. From about, I want to say, let me look it up. I don't want to give wrong information here. Ernest S. Williams. Nope, not the same Ernest S. Williams. Maybe I should put, oh, well, here's one conductor. Yes, okay, so not trumpet, he was a cornet player. He was, he was born in, in 1881 and died in 1947. He created the Ernest, S., the Ernest Williams School of Music in Brooklyn, New York. So this guy is a, a big deal. Um, and he had a has a book. Let me see what it what the actual title is called.
Okay, it's called The Secret of Technique Preservation. That was the first routine I ever did. The Secret of Technique Preservation. And the, the routine that I teach, the routine that the, the Physical Trumpet Pyramid grew out of that routine um, in, in, in the sense, okay, so I don't want to say it didn't, in a, fa in a functional sense, it didn't grow out of that routine because it was, um, my routine is very, very different. I'm talking about like just the, the, the logic of even having a routine, right? So I, from the time that I started doing the Ernest S. Williams to the time that I started doing my own routine, there was a gradual shift. I started with his routine, and then I started switching stuff out. But I never stopped doing a routine from that moment. I hope that makes sense. So, you know, when I tell people that my books are based on, are not based on, but rooted in traditional trumpet pedagogy, that's what I mean. I would just tweak stuff, tweak stuff, tweak stuff, and then before I knew it, like when the with the chops books, the chops books are unique, but they're only unique in that they've been tweaked so much you can't even recognize the original inspirations. Okay. Anyway, yes, I do believe that when you have a routine like that, no matter what routine it is, it don't have to be mine. Um, there's famous routines like the Bill Adam routine and stuff like that. Um, absolutely, they do help you. I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Anthony. Um, it keeps everything in line. Gabriel says, Eddie, about books, what is the difference among Chops Express and daily routines? Chop, daily routines, as you get deeper into the book, the routines start to get longer. And you know what? I wrote that book for the students I had at that time. And they were supposed to get gradually longer and gradually more difficult and gradually higher. But one of the routines, the, the length of the routine is out of order. So like, for example, the I call it in that book, I call it group three. Group three takes like a whole hour to do. And it shouldn't. But it does. That's, that, that ended up being a mistake. But um, now another difference between Chops Express and Daily Routines. Oh, so I didn't finish that. The, the main difference is the length of the routine. I set out when I wrote Chops Express to make all seven routines around 15 minutes long or shorter. So like I can do the, the, the Pioneer one. I can do the Pioneer Chops Express routine in about seven minutes, five minutes. So it is actually very, very short. Um, so that's the main difference. That's why it's called Chops Express. But it's also got some, some tweaks in it that I've made. You know, so I wrote daily routines over a period of from 85 to 90. So a five-year period that I wrote those exercises. Then from 90 to 2000, I'm going to say 2007, so almost 20 years. Over that 20 years, I was, I've been tweaking things, improving, making small improvements. And so the... The Chops Express, even though it doesn't have full-length routines, has some of those improvements in it. So the, in my opinion, the exercises in Chops Express are just a little bit better than the exercises in the daily routines. Anthony says, because we're... There were times when I would finish my practice and then remember later I forgot to do skills or whatever. That's right. So yes, that's a that's definitely one of the advantages 
of having a routine. Gabriel says, can I make 50-50 rule during the day, pyramid in the morning, music in the evening, or is it procession? It's per day. And for that matter, if you cannot work it out for the day, you can. This makes things a little bit more complicated. But if you're, let's say, for example, your week is already shot and you can't stick to the schedule. Because that happens, right? If we're, if we're decent human beings, there are times in our lives when we only have two days to practice for the week. There's nothing wrong with practicing only physical stuff that first day and then only musical stuff the second day. That is pushing it. I think when you do that, you have to be careful that, you know, because then we're getting real close to just doing whatever, right? And, and that can get a little bit dangerous. But if you're organized about it, then it's, it's, that's a good way to pull it off. So, so and, and the, one, the time I would do that, the, the conditions for me, let's say the whole week has been shot already. I know I have these two days to practice, but I know I won't practice any more than that. This is hypothetical, right? Um, and I want to do a, a more difficult routine than the one I was scheduled for that day. Let's say I was supposed to do the Tyro routine on that day, but since I know that's gonna be my only two practice days for the week, I'll do my top routine, the, the virtuoso routine on that first day and get as much other practice as I can. And then the next day I won't do any routine at all. And practice only music that next day. That way I still get the 50-50. Now, if you have a regular week where you're practicing every day, then it's, it's not, you can't really work that out. I hope that makes sense. So yes, that's, that's yes, you definitely do it for the day, not for the session. ACAC says, if a student asks you in your uh, opinion, what is the best thing to practice technique-wise to efficiently play in a marching band, what would you recommend? I would recommend my tonalization studies. I would recommend my tonalization studies. That's where the, the technique comes from. So one of my books is um, called Total Tonalization. So I, I published that book so that people who don't want to do my whole system have access to the scales. Okay, and I call my scales Tonalization Studies. There are actually Tonalization Studies published so far. I think we're missing two of them. So we've got Tonalizations for the, the lowest level, to, for the Tyro level, for the um, player level, all the way up to the to the pro level, and so the difference between tonalization studies and scales is that with the tonalization studies, first of all, we only do one scale per day, and whereas traditionally when you practice scales, you do them all in one day, right? We do one scale per day. And we do patterns on those scales. And then we flip the pattern. And then we invert it and flip it. And there's 20 of those patterns in the book. And so anyone who can play that whole book is going to have awesome technique. Now, I have to, the caveat there is that you have to actually play it right. If you allow a lot of mistakes while you're practicing, then, then it's not going to help you. You have to actually play the right notes. 
Gabriel says, I asked the difference of, on books because my nephew is 15 and she is starting now and I want to buy her one of your routine books. Yeah, for the people who are just starting, I think the Chops Express is better. Now, that said, we have... So I still haven't published the the Pioneer book yet. In fact, the Pioneer book is just my chicken scratch. Oh, let me show it to you. I think over here. I have it here somewhere. Oh, I see it. I see it. And the problem with the Pioneer book that I'm concerned about is that it's probably going to be too short to be an actual book. What I'm thinking about doing is putting Pioneer along with the Chops Express in that book, along with the Daily Routines. That way, the, in that book, they could choose from any of the three routines. I'm considering doing that just to make the book bigger. We want we want more pages in the book because if it's not more pages, the book price per page gets very high. And it, I just don't like that. So I, I try to get more pages in the book so the, the price per page gets lower. But this is what the Pioneer book looks like. It's just my chicken scratch. <laughs> so I should be putting effort into getting this published. There's the, the intervals. I actually like this one. I like playing it. It's, it's very, very relaxing for me to play this. But yes, it's very short. And so we still have three of the Chops books to finish. This one, the, the Master, and the, the Virtual. So Gabriel says, I personally make the pyramid taking exercises from four of your books. Oh, that's nice. I kind of do that too. Go with the flow. That's nice. Chops Pro, Band Expansion, and Switchbacks. Wow, that's very nice. I like that. And when I make switchbacks, I think <laughs> about you so much. <laughs> hey, that's great. I'm, I'm flattered, man. Anthony says, maybe I'm incorrect, but I saw something you said to pair, pair lip bends with slurs. Or was it long tones in the pyramid um i put the lip bends on the long tones you know that um clark's not clark what is it um check with exercise the check with exercise typically goes like this right uh. I thought that was my trumpet. <laughs> I'm like, where did that sound come from? There's a phone ringing. Um, so I actually bend that F sharp. So I've been bending that F sharp since... I don't know, about 35 years ago. Ever since I learned about stamp, I recognized there was an opportunity to do the stamp stuff on the chickwood stuff. And I'm really into this multiple purpose stuff, right? So yes, I did, I did um, start doing that. If you look at the, the, Lip slurs and Chops Express and in the Chops books, 
they are heavily influenced by uh, the the Chickwood study, heavily influenced. And I do that that bending on on those because of that that background. All right, so Gabriel says switchbacks is very hard for me. Yeah, you know what? It's 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 meant to be like pick the ones that you like most. I can imagine, you know, I only played through that stuff a few times. It's it's sort of like an anthology for me, an anthology of now what I what I will say is that I used to play all of those all the time when I first started this system and I kind of selected from those um, kind of, I say kind of because it is kind of, I selected from those, uh, the ones that go into the routine. So yeah, they are kind of hard. So very interesting to me, You know, I'm always trying to, you know, I was thinking about, before we started, I was thinking about some changes I made in my life. Gabriel says, what do you think is better for a young lady, a cornet or a trumpet? Because now she is playing one of my old Yamaha for, I don't know what that is. So I, oh, student model. Okay. Um, I don't think it matters. There are some, if, if she's really small, the cornet helps, but I've seen successful students on both. So I'm, I'm not one of those that think, I hope that makes sense. I don't think it matters. Um, some people say that the, the cornet is easier to learn on because it is uh conical well at least more conical than the trumpet i'm not so sure, so sure i agree with that ac ac says i know of trumpet players that combine your daily routine studies with the arvin book and have great tone but the arvin wears me out alone well, that's that's good i think wearing you out is a good thing Well, I'm glad to hear that some people are, that you know of people are using my book. That's good. And yes, you know, you can combine it with Arvin anytime. In fact, I did that for a long, long time. So what was I doing? I was doing page 115, I think it is in Arvin, with all those intervals. All that stuff, I was doing that. And I was doing the double tongue and the triple tongue stuff in the Arvin book with my routine. So remember, when I first wrote the Daily Routines book, when I first wrote the Daily Routines book, I was concerned about pulling the exercises I was already playing and putting them into a uh, my own method because I thought there were copyright issues. It turns out there are no copyright issues with exercises. How interesting is that, right? Gabriel says, because now she is always around my rotary, and I have to put traps and false webcams everywhere when I go to work. <laughs> so I will buy a new horn for her. That makes sense. <laughs> hey, that's great though, isn't it? To have somebody that interested in it. I think that's a good sign. You know, so often the kids, they're not, they're being forced to do this stuff and they don't want to do it. So, yeah, it's nice. 
So AC, AC asks, how long is your warm-up in the entire routine? So, okay, so, so his, what percentage of the routine is warm-up? I would say, well, let me clarify first. And I know I have a video on this. Um, when I, I think there's a difference between a warm up and a routine, they're not the same thing. And and it, you know, I can tell that you know that already, right? So, um, so to me, a routine, a good routine, should have warm up built into it. Now, how long it takes in the routine to feel like you're warmed up, I can't give you an answer for that. I think it depends on the day. So, like, sometimes I can just do the lip buzz and I feel like I'm warmed up already. On other days, it might take me all the way into the scales before I start feeling like I'm warmed up. And that really has to do with what kind of day I had the day before. So, Gabriel says, what, what tempo is cantible, cantabile? I find it very often in the etudes. I would not call that a tempo. So, I, I have a, a problem with the way this kind of stuff is taught. To me, that marking in the corner is not a tempo marking. That is a, a misrepresentation. That is a style marking, not a tempo marking. And obviously, if they put that on there, what they're trying to get you to do is play it as if you're singing, right? You know, we want to play a lot of times when they have when they have that in the music, it's because maybe a previous section was more technical, right? If you have something that that in the previous section, right, something like that. Then they will say in this next section, cantabile, um, and now you're supposed to put your other hat on and play in a singing style. Let me make sure that's what it says. I don't like sounding like I'm... Um, I know what I'm talking about if I don't know what I'm talking about. So, in the definition says in a smooth singing style. And notice the key word there is style. So that's a style marking. Now, some style markings have the tempo built in. Cantavile does not. Right? It doesn't matter what tempo it is. You can still uh, play something in a singing style. So that's not a tempo marking. Um, but a march, there's only a, 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 a small range of tempo, tempi, that sound like a march. <laughs> if you play a march too fast, it's gonna sound like a funeral dirge. I mean, not fast. When you play a march too slow, it'll sound like a funeral dirge. And if you play it too fast, it's gonna sound like a polka. <laughs> right? So, um, so yes, there are some style uh, tempo implications, but. But no, the, the, a, a lot of times um, there is no tempo implied. And, and that's what, you know, I know that traditionally 
we have on our metronome markings for for certain words, right? For example, Allegro, my metronome is marked from 92 to 132. The truth is this is not right. That's not right. Andante, 72 to 88. The truth is that's not right. That actually means nothing. Tempo-wise. Because, think about it. What if the music is in, what if the music is in 6-8? Doesn't that change this pairing of the of the of the metronome to that one of those words? So I think it was it was very mistaken for them to put actual uh, markings associated with a style. These are styles. I know that I know that um, these styles. I know that these styles have heavy like um, tempo connotations, but to put a fixed number on it is just wrong. It's inaccurate. There's a lot of times when I've had something that was on Dante that sounds absolutely wrong inside that little bracket. On Dante here is 72 to 88. And there's been times when I've had pieces that didn't sound on Dante unless they were down in the 60s. Or that didn't sound on Dante unless they were up near a hundred. I mean, think about that. If I'm and I'm just gonna improvise, but you I hope you can hear that. If the melody for this is like this. <laughs> Does that or does that not sound like Andante? Right? Doesn't that sound like Andante? But if I was trying to play something that had eighths and sixteenths, that's not Andante. Same tempo. Same tempo, so it really does depend on the context. It really does depend. I mean, even so, this one has on at the at the end it has presto. I mean, really, how can you give that number a title like presto when you don't know what the music is? That's not how it works. So, so yes, that's one of the things that I don't like the way is that it's traditionally taught. I don't like it. Um, and you know what? One of the reasons why I, I can have this is because I do compose. And and one of the last things I do in the in the composition process is to try to put the all the 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 words on it right all the styles the tempo and and all that stuff and i struggle sometimes to find the right words to put there and if you ever see something i wrote that says moderato you can know that so moderato is what i put on there if i have no clue what i'm going to put and i'm pushed for time I can't make up my mind, so I just put moderato because I can't think of anything else to put. Normally, I would never put that because that's like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it just sounds indecisive. 
Like, I don't know what I'm doing. So, so yes, those, those markings are not necessarily temple markings. There's a lot like that, right? There's, I mean, when you look at all those um, styles that we see, you know what? A lot of those styles are not are are very specific dance styles. So Anthony says, "Cantavile" means singable or song-like in Italian. So my question is, even if the speed is fast or slow, it should sound song-like. That's right. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. So, yeah. There's a lot of those, a lot of those, um, I mean, think about it. Like as a composer, right? I finished the piece. And when I'm writing, I'm not thinking, I don't, I don't say to myself, Hmm, let's sit down and write something allegro. I don't, uh, I have sounds in my head. I write the sounds down. The point of putting those styles in the corner is to help the, stu the, the student, help the, the performer to play it properly. And, and when we say play it properly, we're talking about We're talking about meter. We're talking about phrasing. We're talking about um, articulation. All of this stuff is wrapped up inside the, the, the style marking. So for example, if we're talking about cantabile, then what we're talking about is, so meter, now meter doesn't come to and play, come into play here, except that we probably wouldn't have a very strong upbeat, right? So the meter is going to be a smoother, smoother meter. We're going to have legato tongue on cant cantabile, not harsh tonguing. We're going to have legato tongue. Armando Gitala told me well, that, that when I'm playing something like that, it should be um, like a th sound instead of a t sound. Instead of ta ta ta, we're gonna say da da da, da 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 da. Instead of ta 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 ta. So that would be legato tonguing. You would have more vibrato. You would have more exaggerated phrase shapes. That's the kind of stuff that, that when I see that on the music, that's what I'm thinking. That's what, what I'm going to try to portray in the way I'm playing. And most styles should do that. Oh, and what I was saying earlier is that a lot of these styles come from dances, right? So, you know, we have this in jazz too, right? So they'll say, we'll do a foxtrot. We'll do a boogie woogie. We'll do th these different things, right? Um, so they have the same thing in classical music too. So like when you have a minuet, a minuet is, a, is not just a style. It's also a, a dance. And the dance, because it is a dance, there's a, a specific tempo involved. You would not play, uh, for example, minuet is in three and so is a waltz is in three, but you would not play a minuet as fast as a waltz. So there's a little bit of tempo insinuated. But we're really looking more at style. <laughs> so Gabriel says the worst is the one at the beginning of the Artunian. 
the rubato. So now that is, that's not a style, that is a tempo, we call it a tempo alteration. So rubato is not a style, well, rubato is a tempo marking, basically saying there's no time. So, ba, 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 ba. Right? So the tempo is going to change. It's going to speed up. It's going to slow down. It's going to speed up. It's going to slow down. That's what rubato is. So here's the thing to keep in mind for rubato. Is that you don't... Just because there's no fixed time does not mean there is no time. This is the key to doing a good rubato. So if I'm playing a piece, instead of thinking, so here's a piece, and then here comes a rubato. That's not right. There's still a, a, a beat, there's still a tempo, it's that the tempo's not set. So, rubato would be like this. Here's the time. Now, here comes the rubato. That's the rubato. Okay? Gabriel says, do I play the two phrases in the same way? or I better change a little. You can play them either way. Play it either way. Do you know what? Let me get that. I haven't played that in years. This is the last concerto I ever worked on. I didn't finish it. And this is the wrong mouthpiece. I would not use this mouthpiece, but I, I want to give you an example. So when you hear that, what, what I'm doing is what I was saying earlier. Right? So, um, that keeps going off. Um, I hope that makes sense. So, and yes, I think the way you make that sound better is to make sure you're still counting the beat, but that the beat is getting slower or faster. And you were asking last week about tapping your foot. This is definitely a good place to tap your foot. So if this is your foot, bum, 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 So you definitely keep track of the beats while you're doing this. Anthony says dances or maybe opera. <laughs> Gabriel says sorry for classical questions. 
I don't have any problem with classical questions. You know, the thing is, I don't consider myself a, I hate the word expert. The more I learn about what experts are today, the less I believe in experts. I don't, I think, I think being called an expert is basically a curse. So I don't want to sound like I'm saying I'm not an expert at classical music because that that would actually elevate me above the experts, in my opinion. <laughs> so I know that to some people that's probably kind of sacrilegious. But, um, but yes, I have... I have knowledge and understanding of the classical music. I play classical music. I'm not just a jazz player. I and more importantly, I cla uh, most of the compositions I've ever written are classical compositions. Classical in the sense that they're not jazz and they're not pop. So yes, most of my most of my compositions would be appropriate in a college recital type stuff. So um so yes, I don't have problem with answering classical questions. I just know that there are a lot of people out there that know more about this stuff than I do. But um what I do know I'm very happy to share. I guess is what I'm saying. So Yeah, Anthony says you're a classy guy. <laughs> yeah, one of these days you guys are gonna have to meet each other, huh? Um, Gabriel says thanks a lot. That was very useful. You're welcome. Yeah, I I learned the Artunian because I thought. Now, I didn't finish learning it, but this is back when I was still working on classical repertoire. I have quite a library of, of classical pieces, and a lot of them I have memorized. And I just stopped working on all of it because I, at, a, at, at some point you have to be practical, right? And if I'm not getting any calls at all to play any of that stuff, it makes no sense for me to spend that much time working on it. So I have switched in the in the recent years to doing more of the jazz stuff instead of that. Hello, Gonya. Gonya asks, how do you tell your students to go about working on accuracy? I've been playing the same no, over and over again, taking the horn off and putting it back on each time. So that's one way to do it, okay? Um, but, you, okay, so I think you have to understand what, where accuracy issues come from. There's two types of accuracy issues. One is because hearing what, what you're hearing is not what the instrument is tuned to. So be, believe it or not, you could be cracking notes because you're out of tune. Now, when I say out of tune, what I mean is out of tune to yourself. Okay, so like if you're not using your slides, if you're not using, for example, alternate fingerings where there should be alternate fingerings, then you will be, so this note to this note is going to be sharp. So a good example of that is the D, right? So the D, if you don't use your slide, the D in the staff is, is naturally flat, and I mean really flat. And the D down in the bottom is naturally sharp. So if you're trying to do intervals, okay, I'm not cracking any of those notes, but if you're trying to do that without using the slide, 
You're going to be more prone to, to cracking notes. So that's the first thing. And, and, and another way that we apply that is if you're playing with a band and you're not in tune with the band, you're going to crack a lot of notes. Because where you're hearing the notes is not where the horn is tuned. And we crack notes when that the pitch we're hearing is not the pitch that the instrument is accepting. And the farther off that is, the more likely you are to crack the note. So there's, there's two things we can do to fix that side of it. One is to learn how to adjust the trumpet so that it's not out of tune. The other thing is to improve your ear. And I, I think the best thing that I teach for your ear is the tonalization studies. And we were talking about that earlier. Now, the other side, what, the other thing that will make you crack notes is when the pressure on one lip is more than you have on another lip. And, so, and what this usually has to do with is the pivot. So, for example, if you are someone who just holds the trumpet in position and does not move it whatsoever, you are going to be more likely to crack notes. So, like... And you're also going to get weird sound on some of the notes, right? So I, I specifically held the trumpet so that it would not move. That's not how I play. And also your range is going to go away too. See how I'm cracking those notes up there? Because the, the instrument has too much pressure on the top lip. So we want to make sure that we're, we're adjusting the, the angle of the trumpet to match what the lips are doing. Now that was a very slight, subtle change, but if you look at the tip of the bell, you're going to see that it's moving about this much. Right? Oh, I moved it. I went the wrong direction. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's weird when I'm thinking about it. Okay, so there is that. So, so we're going to break, break this into two categories uh, for accuracy, right? One is your ear. And the other category is uh, pressure on the chops that shouldn't be there. Getting the angle of the horn to be exactly right. So now, if what you're trying to do is just play that note, let's say the note you keep cracking is F. And I'm using that because I've had that before. So my impression is that's what you've been doing, is just picking up the note, horn and trying to play that. that. That is something that does work. However, I don't think it works very well. It works because it, make, it forces you to confront the problem. It doesn't actually fix the problem. It doesn't actually fix the problem. So when you play... When you play the tonalization studies, when you play the tonalization studies, you're getting to move the, the angle of the instrument and do your ear gradually from here to there. I hope that makes sense. Yologio Olivo says, hello, I'm in my 30s and I and just learning the trumpet. I'm getting better, but I'm stuck in how and what I should learn. I can almost improvise and I feel some of the notes naturally. I can read already. I can do intervals, but I feel like I'm working without direction. 
let me skip. How, how do we practice and memorize skills? Been kind of stuck. Okay, so my method of practicing skills uses what I call the um, uh, expansion method. And here's the thing is you should, uh, a lot of people skip steps. We want to do 10 times on each step. So, so let's say on the first one we do just uh, on C, C to D to C. We're going to do that 10 times. Even though it's so easy, we want that 10 times because that's our foundation. Oh. Then we're going to do that ten times. Then we're going to do that ten times. That's how we. How my. That's my approach. That's my approach to learning a skill, in other words, being introduced to that skill. Then after you've done that, we want to do the tonalization studies, which I talked about earlier in the video. Okay. Now, Gonya says, yeah, that's an issue for me that I'm working on. I tend to put more pressure on the top lip, and it causes some accuracy issues and occasionally damage to the tissue if it gets bad. See? I told you. <laughs> I tend to miss from around F and A at the top of the staff because the setup is inconsistent. So, yeah, so the, when you say the setup is inconsistent, that, that wording it that way kind of bothers me a little bit because uh, I don't know. So what are you doing for a routine? If you're doing a routine, that shouldn't be happening. Or, or is what's happening is that you have a different embouchure for the higher notes because that's, that could explain all of that. So, and, and that happens a lot, right? There's people that when they're playing, they can play fine. And then when they go to the stuff above the staff, they have to actually do something different. Right? They have to do something different to get those notes to sound. So I hope that makes sense. You want to be careful with that. Anyway. Gabriel says, Eddie, do you pivot bell up going higher? So I don't like to think of it as the bell. I think of it as my head. So the bell will go higher when I'm playing lower. And the bell goes lower when I go higher. That one I did wrong. So it's best if I demonstrate with arpeggios. <laughs> I just did the opposite. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, I try to exaggerate when I'm showing it to people, but it also makes me sound terrible. But I want the students to see how that pivot looks. Okay, I see that we're out of time. It's always nice to hang out with you guys. Um, we can talk more about pivot in another video. I mean, another Q&A, if you guys bring it up. Because I have my feelings, my, my feelings, uh, my opinion about pivot. I don't teach pivot in the way that I've heard other people teach. So I think some people might find that interesting. All right. Okay, well, good. Thank you, guys. We'll see you on the next, next Q&A. Uh, God bless you, and thanks a lot.